Okay, I'm very pleased to, to be here. It has been quite hectic. But the main reason why I did not answer uh, your mail is because I was in the field. And uh, I did not have access to regular internet. Okay, I had a different, so it's why I did not see your mail. <laughs> to make it clear. Okay. I don't believe. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yes, yes, I, I do, I do. Um, so, I will tell you about uh, penguins. Therefore, I will try to refresh this tropical atmosphere because I find it very, very tropical here. It's very hot. And um, I guess it will be illustrate um, um, some aspects of uh, Jennifer's talk about the way uh, you are progressing into research. Because what I will show you now has been obtained over 40 years. And as you will see, uh, ecology is really today a multidisciplinary discipline. Because in this talk, I will deal with uh, climate. I will deal with uh, evolutionary biology. Uh, with physiology, ecology, uh, and the tools that uh, have been used uh, in our findings uh, were sometimes microelectronics, sequencing, uh, mass spectrometry. So really, the, this is not the, the problem, the tool you have to use. What you have to do is when you are raising a question, whatever is the techniques to answer it, you have to progress further. So, uh, I will first put uh, this talk on penguins on an evolutionary perspective. Because penguins are not only in the far south. The ancestors of penguins were close to this little blue penguin that you can see about 60 kilometers uh, from Melbourne uh, on Phillip Island. And uh, Japanese come there uh, in jumbo jet to see the penguins parade uh, of these birds uh, at the beginning of the night coming out from the sea to breed into burrows. So again, don't think that penguins are only creatures of sea ice. Therefore, because the ancestors of penguins were close uh, to uh, this uh, temperate, uh, subtropical temperatures, it means that those penguins which are there in the subantarctic area, like uh, king penguins, are intermediate, considering adaptation to cold. And emperor penguins, this will remind you of uh, March of the Penguins, which has been based on, uh, uh, partly on, uh, largely on our work. They are therefore the most advanced, considering evolution, adaptation uh, to uh, life in the Antarctic. These birds, are the only terrestrial, at this stage, terrestrial vertebrates to breed during the severe Antarctic winter. No else. They are the only ones to stand on sea ice. They only feed at sea, and they walk, as you know, on long distances to get to very well anchored sea ice sea ice which will not disappear during a storm and which is usually blocked between the Antarctic continent and islands. So they don't breed everywhere on sea ice. There, as you probably know, they huddle together. And when I started in the beginning of the 70s, it was known that huddling cut down their rate of weight loss by half, but nothing more. In ecology, 
what you have to know is that the main question is what is the trade-off between investing energy to get success in breeding, raise a chick, versus preserving its own survival. These are long-lived animals. And it is well known now in evolutionary biology that long-lived animals preserve much more their own survival than short-lived animals, like, for example, the tits, the tits that are raising a lot of uh, young. Uh, they are not, from our perspective, so careful about their investment, but they live for only a few years. Okay? So, this will be the structure of the first part of my talk. How do, how is this trade-off managed to invest in order to succeed in breeding while preserving adult survival, which is the best way to, to breed again. Therefore, we will first consider the mechanisms which allow the adults to save energy in order to succeed. And so, the first question I had over the years, but as you will see, it took many years to answer it, because it depended on techniques, on available techniques, to answer this question. How does a huddle function? How does it work? And it's only recently that using biologging, we were able to understand how works a huddle. What is biologging? Biologging is using miniaturized equipment. This is equivalent of a tap uh, of a computer, small computer. There are sensors. And here is an example not on a, for, on a penguin, it's on a flying bird. It's on a gannet. It's a study we did in South Africa where we equipped, we instrumented um, uh, gannets keep gannets with data loggers uh, which had captors for depth, for pressure, therefore, for depth, and accelerometry. And this is accelerometry. And this shows you how powerful is such kind of instruments. So from the pattern of surging and having recordings, it's possible to know that the bird is taking off. Thereafter, it's possible to know that the bird is using either a flapping or gliding. This is gliding. And it is possible from the pressure which is recorded to know that the bird has been diving. With other captors like speed, we were able to determine that the gannet would decelerate one tenth of a second uh, before reaching the sea water, the surface of the sea, uh, decreasing from 100 kilometers uh, to 80 kilometers an hour in the dive. So this shows how powerful. Of course, there are all kinds of captors of sensors today, and we use different sensors for impro penguin, but thanks to biologging, we were able to determine how a huddle function. And here we used, therefore, loggers, which were uh, put on uh, either the back, or you will see later, in the deep body of impro penguins. So now it's on the back of the bird, either here or on the, on, on, on the back, and with two sensors, one for light and one for temperature. 
So, it records the light around the bird. And here is the light during the day in Antarctica, where we are studying. It's the same spot where much of the penguins was made in Adeliland. And here is the level of the light during the night. You see here is the night. So what is going on with the light? Measurement of day light, and it goes to zero. Zero means because it's very sensitive centers, sensors, that the birds are so close together that there is no light coming. It means that they are huddling very tightly, very closely. To give you an, one idea of the, this behavior, we have seen sometimes an improper penguin, 40 kilo, pushed up by the pressure and lying above the colony. So they try, they make very hard to be close together, to minimize the surface exposed to the cold. And in contrast to what is said in the movie, because in fact, the movie March of the Penguins was a fantastic success because it was uh, managed by Walt Disney. They were very good to have everybody on Earth, people crying, you know, these poor animals in the cold, in a severe cold. But what they say in the movie, therefore, is that these poor birds that are in such a severe environment, which is an intelligent design that was told at that time, really very ridiculous, um, they, they would stay for days and weeks in the huddle to avoid the cold. It's wrong, totally wrong. As you see from the light, and it's only a few days here, you see, it goes down, up, down, up, and down, and so on, regularly. So they don't huddle longer than, on average, one hour and a half. Then, why? And the answer is given by the temperature which is measured around the bird. We are at a temperature about minus 15, minus 20 in uh, Antarctica at that time. Uh, we, are, we don't have the same very, very low temperature like, for example, uh, near McMurdo, the US station. It's because the uh, Adelie coast is uh, close to, uh, is not, uh, uh, it's, it's only at, at a latitude which is uh, uh, 62, 64. C'est ça, hein? 64. Uh, but it's one of the windiest uh, places on Earth. So you should really cons consider the relationship with uh, ambient temperature and wind. Then, you see the temperature. As soon as they are huddling together, the temperature is going on. Within 20 minutes, it goes to about 20 degrees. And when it is a little more, 31 hour, it goes up to 35. So which means that because of the huddle together, emperor penguin make a tropical environment. And therefore, the reason why they are huddling, breaking, huddling, breaking, it's because it goes too, too high temperature. So they need to huddle together to reduce heat loss, but as soon as they raise a temperature of about 35, they break. Then, I will show you. Here, these birds are huddling together very closely. And it breaks here. It has broken here. So it's going like that all the time. It shows you the difference. This was at the time, and then 
one hour and a half later. You see how? So it's completely wrong that they stay uh, in, um, in the warmth to avoid completely this uh, severe winter. And if I go back to the previous slide, you see in, uh, in the movie March of the Penguins, this kind of behavior. Do you remember what is the comment? The comment is, these birds look, are very excited because the females are coming back, of course, late. <laughs> this is not science. I think this was a very successful uh, movie because uh, it attracted a lot of interest for biodiversity, but it is not science. Then, one question is, the both mates arrive together at the same time, they reunit, they pair, they copulate, and it takes about one month, 40 days, uh, to get the egg. Of course, they save energy during that time. And the questions we had in mind, how do they manage not to lose it, each other? And why, why did we have these questions? It's because it's known from the earlier studies that after mating, they don't sing. They are very quiet. They are very quiet um, because if they don't do that, it happens sometime, a bird which is not yet mated will come and break the couple. So the question then, if they are quiet, if they are quiet, how do they manage not to lose each other in this hurdle? And so we studied that. So uh, first, I want to tell you that we know that there is a change uh, when, when there is a very, very cold weather, very sto uh, high storm, the hurdle is pushed by, by the, the wind. And those birds that are outside here will walk very slowly until they are protected from the wind. And the, the time the bird each individual spent outside and inside is the same. So they are not uh, very, in, very clever birds that are spending more time inside. No. Everybody is sharing same time inside and outside. Then we put logos on uh, birds of different pairs to know what was going on. Do they separate? Do they find each other afterwards? And we have the answer. This is a couple. Uh, in blue, it's the male. In uh, violet, come on, it's, it, it's a female. And you see a fantastic synchronization for the couple. Uh, when, for example, uh, it is there, they are not huddling. You understand that? They are not huddling. This is only when they are huddling. And they are exactly huddling during the same amount of time. So it's a perfect synchronization because they are close to each other. When the, um, when the huddle breaks, the male is usually walking first. And he's ex exaggerating. It's funny gait, you know, they are walking like that. And the bird, which is the male, which is walking first, is exaggerating this waddling gait in order to make sure that the female behind will not lose it when walking among thousands of birds. Then the question is uh, when you have different pairs, are they all synchronized? As you may guess, the answer is not. 
So we had, for example, four pairs. This is when there is no pair huddling. When there is one pair huddling, the proportion of time, two pairs, three pairs, four pairs. So it's only a small part of the time, about 6%, that the four pairs, the four pairs were synchronized uh, uh, together at the same time, which means that in the colony, they were in different parts, which were sometimes uh, very tight and uh, not, not synchronized. So now you see how it works. But what is now the energy uh, interest of holding together? And we did that after the exchange of the egg, because we did that on males. We took the advantage of the time when after about 3, 30, 40 days, there is an exchange, the exchange of the egg, because at that time they go out from the huddle. So at that time, without any risk, uh, we could capture a male. So the female is there. Um, the male is uh, waiting for the egg. And the next slide show you how it works. Here you have a part of the body without feathers, which is in contact with the egg. The egg is sitting on the feet and is covered by feathers. So it's like a pocket. And um, so we took advantage at that, uh, that time to, uh, to make some uh, measurements. I will explain you thereafter here. But it changed with time. When I started in, when I overwintered in 72, uh, the only techniques available was to measure metabolic rate in penguins was uh, oxygen consumption, which was used at that time, for example, for humans to determine uh, the hypertrophy of thyroid, for example. You would measure metabolic rate with oxygen consumption. And when you study in humans uh, or animals, um, how metabolic rate from oxygen consumption evolve uh, while ambient temperature is going down, you first have a minimum. Here, we are all about at the minimum because we are at what is called temperature neutrality. Under some ambient temperature, which is called the lower critical temperature, which is minus 10, in improper penguins, which means that improper penguins are maintaining a minimum metabolic rate until minus 10, there is an increase. The same we have below about 18 degrees Celsius. Two in order because we are maintaining our body temperature of 37. So when uh, it's cooling, like, like it was last week in the US, uh, is a, because the control system is very bad, <laughs> very cold <laughs> in, in the rooms very often, a waste of energy. And uh, it was very cold and people were, uh, were shivering, you know, they were increasing their metabolic rate. We were increasing our metabolic rate. And uh, in propane winds do that uh, only below minus 10 in order to maintain their 37 degree Celsius temperature. It took, and this was in 72, uh, but it published in 76, 76, yes, but I had to wait until the 90s to have a techniques of a label to measure metabolic rate in the huddle using stable isotopes. Because from stable isotopes, from uh, what is called the doubly labeled water technique, uh, which is the difference between uh, the decrease in oxygen 18 and deuterium, uh, you are able to determine the average metabolic rate. And uh, here, 
is those data we published uh, in 1997 uh, uh, on uh, the energy expenditure of uh, huddling in propane winds. And as you see here, their metabolic rate is lower than the minimum metabolic rate of an individual bird. So we don't know how it changes in relation to temperature, but the average value is below a minimum. This is quite difficult to understand, to be lower than a minimum. If you want to decrease heat production, you usually decrease a set point. This is example is hibernation. Hibernating animals are decreasing their body temperature and they are therefore uh, decreasing their energy expenditure. This was quite intriguing for emperor penguins because as you already know, they are incubating their egg. Is it possible to decrease metabolic rate through a drop in the body temperature uh, while incubating an egg? So we put uh, logos, data logos again, but for deep body temperature. So this was deep in the body. And we compared here for two birds, one which managed uh, incubation, and this one which lost, what happens sometimes, uh, uh, which lost his egg. For these two examples, you see that ambient temperature, uh, sorry, deep body temperature uh, first decreased during the period when the males were together with the females during the first, uh, sometimes it, uh, two weeks or one month of uh, fasting before the egg was uh, laid and transferred to the male. And this is the same for us. I mean, when we are fasting, we are decreasing our body temperature. And it, it, it would be, for example, uh, 36, uh, our body temperature, uh, a decrease of one degree if we are fasting. But then, you see, it re-increased. It is re-increasing to keep up at a constant 37. So it means that because of the incubation, in contrast to the bird which has left, uh, which has lost his egg, in the bird which is incubating, it is maintained remarkably at 37, but not in those birds which are not uh, incubating. Uh, and this kind of change in temperature is quite remarkable because the lowest uh, measures here are close to those of a hibernating bear. I don't know if you are aware, but the temperature of a hibernating bear is between 33 and 34 degrees Celsius. It's not like, like, like a marmot at five degrees. Uh, hibernating bear is 33, 34. But then, since we know that those birds successful in incubation are at a lower average metabolic rate than um, uh, individual birds at a minimum metabolic rate, it means that the mechanism for uh, saving energy is different of hibernation. It means that huddling together is equivalent to a very huge large animal a lot of individual animals are making a huge animal because you probably know that there is a relationship between the surface of heat loss and the volume producing heat. If you have a wool, a huge organism, you are decreasing the surface in relation to the production of heat. It's the way it goes without a drop in deep body temperature. I have no time to get into details, but after we found that, we studied newborn rabbits. You know, it was told that they are naked, so they need to get huddling to, to, to huddle together in a nest 
because they have a very poor insulation, like a young cats also. But it's not the right explanation. We found that by huddling together, they are able to decrease their energy expenditure the same way as adult impro penguins are doing. But the difference between impro penguins and rabbits or cats, newborn, is that impros are very well insulated, which explains that at some stage, after half an hour, one hour, they are overheating and have to break, while the new uh, born cats or uh, rabbits don't need because they are naked. So it's not because it is a defect of insulation that they're huddling together, it allows them to stay in a nest, saving energy while maintaining high body temperature, same mechanism for the emperor. So if I have a message to take home, you have two ways to reduce energy expenditure, hibernation, torpor, decreasing body temperature, or huddling together, at least in these animals. Now, what about the king penguin, which is uh, the intermediate, it is the closest parent of the um, emperor penguin, and which is the intermediate penguin in relation to adaptation to cold. King penguins obviously don't live in such a cold environment. We are in the middle of the subantarctic, of the austral, of the southern ocean. Minimum ambient temperature is around zero degrees Celsius. They start to breed during the summer. Nothing unusual, of course. But they don't huddle together. They don't need at such a temperature. They maintain a small distance as a way to disrupt uh, uh, birds of prey, to get closer. If a bird of, when you have a, a bird of prey coming, it will stay on the periphery. It will not get inside. It would have a, an awful time. During the winter, Presumably, you don't know. During the winter, uh, king penguin chicks are abandoned by their parents. On the first few days of the winter, which start around early May, we are in the southern hemisphere, the parents disappear. And those chicks, which have reached a body weight of about 12 kilo, will survive, but not these poor chicks because they have to start up to four months, five months. Because the parents only come back after, um, at the end. But we wanted to explain that. So uh, we used uh, Argos, miniaturized Argos transmitters. And this is where we started to come to earth science, to climate questions. And what we found is that during the winter, here is Crozet, where we are working. Crozet is uh, uh, roughly at a latitude of uh, 45. So uh, it's not very far south, considering the uh, latitude. But you, think, you see here that in May, the adults, although they have a cheek on these islands, are going to the far south, to the sea ice margin. To make a comparison, it would be uh, swimming animals, leaving their offspring in La Rochelle, for example, and swimming to northern Norway to find their food. It would be a similar um, uh, migration. And during the winter, most of the time, the adults ensure their own survival because resources have dropped. This is the reason why they live. So we are coming to another kind of question. We should not only consider climate, but also relationship between climate and food. 
What about the summer? Obviously, the distance is not comparable to the long, almost 2,000 kilometers they have to go to feed during the uh, winter. And during the summer, the parents come back and feed those, the, the chicks which have survived, regurgitating food from their stomach, which means they are close by. Again, here you see it's a sh much shorter distance, but this is an average. In fact, and we are coming to climate variability, if we consider the elevation of sea level, which reflects the temperature of the sea, with warm years here and cold years here, are you familiar with elevation, sea level elevation? Or should I explain quickly? The distance is measured by satellites like uh, Jason, Topex Poseidon, which are measuring the distance at a distance of about 1,000 kilometers with an accuracy of one centimeter or so. And this is the average distance. When the temperature of the sea is increasing, the distance is lower. So the elevation is higher. So this is again warm temperatures and cold temperatures. And there is, I know there is here uh, one session on the Southern Ocean and climate variability with uh, Yong Yong Park. And he's a specialist of that. And he demonstrated that uh, uh, this warming is partly uh, related to uh, an influence of El Nino in the Pacific, which means that the polar front, where we know now that king penguins go to feed because they rely, they are specialist feeders, and they relied on particular family of fish, myctophyte fish, and myctophyte fish are most abundant on the polar front. The polar front is going far south from Crozet, which means that the distance on warm years can be more than 500, 600 kilometers versus 300, 400 uh, during uh, cold years, where the polar front is closer to the colony. What are the consequences regarding the breeding cycle? Let us consider the male, which is because both mates are uh, participating in the incubation in contrast to the emperor in king penguins. In, king, in emperor penguins, it's only the male. Here, it's both female and male. But usually, the male assumes the last part, the three last weeks of the incubation. What happens on, uh, and the female comes back at the time around the hatching. What happens uh, on a cold year? The distance is shorter, and the female usually comes back before hatching. No problem to take her duty regurgitating food for the new hatch chick. But to go at a distance of 500, 600 kilometers takes about one week more. And the female come back too late. We found that the male has come with food in his stomach to ensure the three last weeks of the incubation. And therefore, preserving food in his stomach. When we found that, and it makes the cover of nature in 2000, and for Christmas, it was a feather's gift for the chick. Uh, when I found that, um, I wanted to study the mechanism. So I visited many companies interested in the food uh, industry. They were not interested. They were not interested because they said, if you had already uh, found the explanation without a patent, we would be interested. And thanks to Hubert Curien, I got the money 
for four years uh, using uh, mass spectrometry, sequencing, molecular biology, proteomics. We found a molecule, and this is why I suggested for my institute the name of Ubercaria. This is the increase in this molecule we found, which is a small protein, 38 amino acids. It is an antibiotic molecule because, obviously, uh, to uh, conserve food in the stomach at a temperature of 37 would kill the animal or the chick because it tried try to keep fish at a temperature of 37. You will see after three weeks. <laughs> so we were able not only to find this molecule, which is particular, which is specific uh, to uh, the king penguin, but we are able also to have it produced by biotechnology. And here on Petri dish, you see when adding on this population of Aspergillus fumigatus, which is responsible for aspergillosis, when you add our molecule, which is similar to penguin's molecule because it's a synthetizer, the spore have disappeared. Disappear. And the same with Staphylococcus aureus. So it's very efficient against uh, nosocomial uh, agents. And now um, we are related with a company which is trying to, uh, uh, to produce this molecule um, uh, of biomedical interest. Obviously, in those animals that are not, that are di digesting, and uh, that are not preserving food in their stomach uh, to uh, feed the uh, uh, chick if the female has not come back, uh, this molecule is not produced in the stomach. Very interestingly, let us consider here when the male is coming, because, I mean, also the male uh, can have difficulties in arriving three weeks before the end, depending on the conditions at sea. If it comes uh, three weeks before, on average, it has 200 grams of nourishment preserved in the stomach. This is sufficient to ensure um, uh, waiting for the female for eight days feeding the cheek during eight, eight, ten days until the female comes back. If the meal is delayed and comes uh, right on the time uh, where hatching does occur, it comes back with a lot more of food, one kilo. If it comes later, Usually, he does not bring food as if he knows that the female has been not able to feed the chick at hatching, has disappeared and left. We don't know how it works, but this is, these are the findings. Then, we are coming to the last part, which is uh, what happens when the bird is reaching a critical amount of fuel in his reserves and the mate has not come back. In other words, how do penguins know, it's a way to say it of course, that it is time to refuel before it is too late how do they know? How is their departure triggered, which explains that you find abandoned chicks that are dying in the colony? We found that there is a minimum weight loss for the birds in the colony, and this minimum weight loss uh, is, uh, I will, this is summarized here, corresponds to phase three. I will explain briefly because it is similar in humans you have three periods during a long fast. It's the same in humans, in other animals. During the first phase, there is an adaptation to fasting. 
you are using uh, your glycogen to uh, make glucose and decreasing your energy expenditure, then during phase two, which is very long, 100 days in, uh, in pro penguins, and the same in humans, you are relying, if you, if you are fasting for uh, one week or so, uh, you are relying on essentially your body fat. About 96% of, of your energy is from fat and only 4% from proteins. But then there is a third phase which is characterized by an increase in protein breakdown. And we found that the bird lives at this transition. They abandon their egg or cheek when reaching this stage from essentially lipid mobilization to protein breakdown. But they still have a significant amount of fat. So our next question was, how is it, is there some safety margin when they leave? Because my guess was that they anticipate and they have a safety margin, of course. So we, uh, we, we monitored in pro penguins two birds here. This is the coast of the Antarctic continent. Here it is the Antarctic continent, and here it is sea ice. The distance from the open sea to the colony may be 200 kilometers. Run, uh, training in pro penguins to walk on treadmills and measuring their oxygen consumption while uh, walking on treadmills, we are able to determine that their safety margin regarding uh, uh, lipid reserves is of 180 kilometers as a distance to be covered. So then the question was, what is the distance they really have to cover? I don't know if you are aware of the, the uh, word polynia, but in two sea heights, you have large areas of open uh, sea that are called polynias. Here, you have one and here. And these two birds, obviously, were able to find these polynias at a distance of uh, roughly 130 to 150 kilometers. So there is a safety margin like when you have this being uh, with a light, you still have enough uh, fuel to go to the next station. Then, what is the mechanism? And we have worked a lot on that. But to start with, uh, obviously, we could not continue on penguins. So, Reading the literature, I found that it was known, uh, some uh, US colleagues years ago had found that when you are fasting a rat, um, at some stage, there is a huge increase in locomotor activity when the rat is in a running wheel. It's not a dying rat. I mean, uh, the rat is then, it still has uh, uh, lipid reserves, and is still uh, in a very, very good shape. The rat is able to jump out of uh, a cage uh, much more easily than a normal rat would do. So I thought it might be similar. This increase in uh, Ronil wheel activity, because the, these colleagues found that it would happen later on obese rats. So I thought if it is related to the body fuel, then it could be similar to the penguin, which is motionless, or only for the hurdle uh, prospect, but doesn't move for almost four months, and then quit abandoning egg or chick uh, without any stop uh, during 12 days to go back to a pollinia. And these are, again, the three phase. Here, it's nitrogen excretion. So again, 
This increase in nitrogen in the rat is showing the uh, protein breakdown that we knew from the penguin to be still a reversible phenomenon. And therefore, we found that the increase in locomotor activity started at that time. So, the behavioral change of the running rat occurs in the same metabolic situation than in the penguin reaching phase three. Then we studied the molecules in the brain and we found that in the hypothalamus of the rat, you probably know that the hypothalamus is involved in feeding control, there is an increase in neuropeptide Y, which is the main peptide involved in hunger, in pressure for hunger. So the story, now how we can uh, uh, understand, is that the penguin is anorexic for almost four months, and at some stage, when it reached a drop in the proportion of its lipid fuel, which is exactly the same than in the rat, the loss of 80% of lipid, still 20% available, then it is triggered to refuel before it is too late. We know also now that in the penguins, in the wild, it, it is associated with an increase in glucocorticoids, corticosterone. <coughs> you know, in Tour de France, they are very often trapped because they take glucocorticoids, and they try not to be trapped, of course. Uh, but it's the same story. The bird in the wild has an increase, but it's not, c'est pas du dopage, mais um, there is an increase in glucocorticoids. But it needs, in the same time, a drop in prolactin, which is involved in parental care. So it's a very, it's a cocktail, hormonal cocktail, which is deciding that the bird should refuel before it is too late. But it's not sufficient to be triggered to refuel before it is too late. You probably know from, for the very, from the very sad stories during the Second World War that when you are starving, there is an atrophy of the intestine, and it can be very dangerous uh, to refuel, to refeed too much before, uh, after a long fast, and many died. So, the question I had in mind is, would it be possible that the birds, the animals, anticipate this situation? So again, in the rat here, we studied the metabolic functioning of the intestine. These are intestine villi. At the same time, there is, in phase three, this increase in this molecule which tells the animals it should refeed, promoting hunger. You see the black dot here? There is cellular division in the intestine to restore the intestine. Why is it so that there is an atrophy during a fast? Because it costs a lot of energy. But now, we are no longer in a situation where you should save energy to starve a long time. The priority is to refuel before it is too late. And therefore, you have cellular division. But what is fantastic is that there is another mechanism in addition to cellular division, which is a suppression of apoptosis. You know what is apoptosis? Cellular death. Apoptosis. And cellular death um, is still going on during a fast. But at this particular stage, as you see, in this environmental microscopy here, you have no longer a loss of cells at the tip of the intestinal villi. C'est comme une bouture. 
I don't know in English. <laughs> um, so there is a, a cessation of cellular death and the combination of the cessation of cellular death, of apoptosis, the suppression of apoptosis and the cellular division means that very, very quickly there is a restoration. While food is not still available, it's an anticipation. So you have the full story of the adaptations. To finish my presentation, now the question is, is it, are these fantastic adaptations sufficient for the birds to cope uh, with the climate? And then the final questions are, will Antarctic penguins survive to climate change according to IPCC scenarios? Then we had to go to move uh, to um, another kind of approach. As a physiologist, you would work, uh, work on uh, 10 animals or, or so. But to answer th these new questions, you have to work at the population level. If you want to understand what is going on, you, you need to study many individuals. And until re recently, uh, to follow individual penguins, you would use a flipper band. Why? Because in contrast to other birds, the anatomy of penguins' leg does not allow to put a ring. And the pioneers in these studies that uh, equipped either in the States or US or British or Australians or French, uh, South Americans, that monitored penguins thought it's fantastic because then we don't have to capture the bird uh, to read the number. But what about the drag effect when they are moving at sea? To answer this question, we install a system which is still unique to my knowledge. It, it corresponds to underground antennas surrounding a large part of the king penguin colony in Crozet. And we have a unique setup of uh, a unique database of these birds that are equipped with miniature electronic tags, radio frequency identification. Uh, we, it's less than one gram, it's under the skin, and they are automatically identified when getting out or in to their colony. And we have a, a fantastic data set of 7,000 birds that are followed now of known age. And we can relate uh, their uh, survival and uh, uh, breeding success to climate conditions. But first, what about, what about the band? So we compared uh, birds with an electronic tag with or without a band. And this appeared in January. We found that flipper banded penguins have longer foraging trips, a delay in breeding, a lower proportion in breeding. So not only they are late, they are later to start breeding, but the proportion of those coming back is lower to engage into breeding. There is a drop of 40% in breeding success for those which engage into breeding. There is a drop of 44% in adult survival over 10 years. And there is a drop of 50% in chic survival after three years when they are flip abandoned. Since then, I have had a hard time with colleagues <laughs> that have spent their life banding penguins. But relating our last question, which is relationship between climate and um, climate and flip banding or, or not, the two curves here correspond to the population growth rate 
considering that the birds are either non-banded or banded, you see that the relationship is different. For example, here, for very uh, warm sea surface temperature, this is sea surface temperature, SST, sea surface temperature, sorry, I should have said that before. For the very warm temperature, which means there is poor food at sea, it doesn't make any difference if the bird is banded or not. Resources are so poor that even those which are not handicapped uh, failed. Most of the difference in duries during intermediate years. And on cold years, it tends to be better uh, because there is so much food that even those that are handicapped with bending may succeed. Then, we collected all the information about those birds which were not uh, banded, and this is the relationship between sea surface temperature and probability of annual survival. And we found that the probability of survival is decreasing with only 0.3 increase in sea surface temperature. The problem is that the IPCC prediction is an increase of 0.4 degrees C in the next 20 years. And such a drop is sufficient, uh, to, um, uh, sufficient to induce the uh, extinction of a colony. And we are about to submit a new paper uh, where uh, we calculate, we estimate that uh, these colonies of king penguins will be extinct uh, in 150 years according to uh, IPCC scenarios. I have still, so it means here, and this is for emperor penguins, this is what will happen, an extension also for the emperors, uh, starting around, it started around 2000 with a drop in sea ice surface. Why it is so? I remember when March of the Penguins was re uh, released in the US, I was invited, uh, I was interviewed um, on the radio. Uh, it was a famous uh, uh, hour. I mean, uh, everybody uh, at that time would uh, be see, excited about the movie. And I was told by the journalist, uh, it's very bad life for an emperor penguin, you know. They have to walk on a long distance of sea ice. It would be much better uh, if they had a shorter distance to go, isn't it? I said, no, because as you have seen, this slight effect of 0.3 degree means that krill production, which is the base of the food chain in Antarctica is decreasing. In fact, krill production is already affected by a change of 0.1 degrees Celsius. So the temperature is not a problem for the penguins themselves, but they will suffer from the uh, drop, the effect of climate on their resources, on their prey. But obviously, these are specialized birds that are relying on particular uh, marine resources. I did not want to finish this presentation with uh, only the specialist. And the last two slides of my talk are about a generalist. A few years ago, we studied cormorant, Phalacrocorax carbo, the Great cormorant, because it's a tropical, it has a tropical origin. It is a generalist. You find it everywhere on Earth, including in Greenland, and it stays there during the winter. So, because it is a poorly insulated animal compared to the penguins, 
we try to understand how it, it does. And of course, the temperature of the water is very cold in Greenland. What is it compared to, for example, Normandy, where I was born? You see that during the Greenland in winter, where the temperature is in the air is between minus 15 and minus 20, the cormorant is able to feed for the whole day within only 10 minutes. Only within 10 minutes. While it takes 140 to 180 minutes to feed for a day in Normandy. So they adapt the time they spend in the water, and they are able to survive despite their poor insulation because they spend so little time into the water, but obviously they can do so because there is many fish uh, in many prey in Greenland. So these are the main message to take home. Severe cold, in contrast to much of the penguins told us, Severe cold is not a problem for penguins. The main problem is the effect of climate and the abundance and localization of the prey on which they relied as specialist feeders. A slight warming of sea temperature is sufficient to jeopardize their future. And finally, there is a better future for generalists. But do we want to have only cormorants, pigeons, rabbits? Thank you very much. <laughs>